Hi, good morning. Welcome to the last day of the deep learning uh, for science school. I hope you uh, still have the energy to go through another half a day. Um, so uh, today, I mean, earlier in the week, we talked about uh, um, training with gradient descent and we talked how, you know, gradient descent, we do it stochastically, so we use small batches uh, and how, you know, to go beyond that, the small batches has some noise and to go beyond that, um, we actually run into optimization issues because the noise is important. A lot of us, um, a lot of you actually have asked about larger batch training because you want to do training faster, right? Because we deal with very large uh, data sets. So today, most of the program will be on this. Uh, Thurston will talk about uh, uh, how do we do this training on multiple nodes or multiple workers, uh, and even going all the way to the HPC scale. And you'll also talk about uh, large batch training in general, uh, how the problems that you, you know, what kind of problems we run into and how to get around those. Um, and then we'll have a hands-on later today actually doing that uh, in practice on Cori machine. Um, Thurston is an application uh, readiness um, engineer at, uh, at NERSC. His main work is always on optimizing code to run faster on bigger machines. Um, last year, um, he was awarded the uh, Gordon Bell Prize for the first Gordon Bell Prize for a deep learning application running a segmentation model, one of the models that you saw yesterday um, at um, uh, an exa op uh, uh, scale. And he will also tell us about that after he explains all the theory and background. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, let's try that. So <clears throat> thanks for the introduction, Mustafa, and I hope you still have energy for the rest of the day. So <clears throat> I will talk about uh, deep learning training, scaling, and the, I will also do some, um, to bother you a bit with that, with uh, some HPC back background about like uh, communication. Uh, so like complexity of communication algorithms and also a bit of uh, why, why we care about matrix multiplication deep learning. You might know, but especially when you, dis when you distribute that thing, uh, you, you need to think about it uh, more carefully. So I will, I will talk about this a bit. So that, that's my, uh, I'll first give this, this motivation. It's more like an introduction why you do it on a uh, do, uh, distributed uh, deep learning. I think most of you are anyway motivated of doing that. But in general, I think it's, it's, it's good to point out certain things uh, um, which might help. Um, so uh, I will talk about like the communication complexities a bit and about how you can distribute this, the training, uh, so the different methods of doing that. And for that, we need to talk about, so I will talk about a lot about matrix multiplication and you might ask why matrix multiplication, uh, because it's all about that basically. And I will talk like briefly about this as well. So the polarization strategies will then be mentioned, especially like, uh, with the, in light of deep learning. And then I will talk about the, what Mustafa mentioned, the large batch training, what you can do to get convergence, better convergence. Uh, and we'll also talk about things like accuracy improvements, uh, especially when you do distributed deep learning and have a small local batch size, you might think about, okay, what does batch normalization actually like help me here? Uh, and, it, and you can basically get around certain limitations there. And then I will give a brief summary. So that's the first part of my talk. And then in the second part, I will present the works from the, from the Gone Bell last year. Okay. So uh, why do we need to scale deep learning, right? <clears throat> so this is a survey uh, Mustafa conducted in um, 2018, late 2018. And we basically looked at uh, how long the models, typical models uh, <coughs> uh, need to train. Uh, and it looks like we have a lot of like people, like 60% uh, which, which train for like a couple of hours, right? But we also have like uh, um, uh, scientists who want to train for like days or even weeks, right? So basically, uh, this is still doable on a very like very small scale, and then you don't need to uh, bother about like conversion all these things. But for for these kind of like uh, um, like uh, uh, cases, you basically want to uh, have a better method of of like you want to get convergence faster because you want to do, for example, rapid rapid, model, um, rapid prototype, right? You don't want to train your model for two weeks just to to learn that it doesn't work very well. And also the problem scale can be quite big. And then you look at the data sets, especially, they can be quite large. So we have like about like 20% of the folks have like a terabyte or bigger. Okay, so that's quite big. But even here, like 40% of 25% have like 100, 100 gigabytes uh, data set sizes. So yeah, this was, uh, this, uh, so uh, yeah, we, we can just ask uh, questions about like, um, which, this was a uh, survey which uh, targeted machine learning, especially. <clears throat> 
So we just asked, so what do you run? What, do you, what kind of models do you run? And what kind of like, how big is your data set? How big is your, uh, how long do you train? Yeah, this was the data set size. Like uh, we, we just asked them, so what is your typical training data set size you want to train on, right? So, I mean, of course, this, 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 can, and this can include anything like the HPC experiments could be petabytes. They might not want to train on everything, but this can be everything, right? So this is like the, the bin which captures all the rest. And the data sets itself, so uh, this, this, this might look like they have a lot of samples, but the data sets itself can be very, uh, very complex. So they can have like very high dimensional data. Uh, so that means that technically a, a single sample can be of order 50 megabytes already easily or bigger. So that is kind of, uh, uh, so that doesn't mean you have many samples, but you have just have a, like uh, the number of bytes you need to like load and process is quite large. So, um, and also, uh, as you know, models get, get bigger and more compute intensive. So this is like an you know, outdated model now, it's this VGG. But uh, when you look at BERT, like these transformer models, for example, they're like, uh, like billions of parameters, right? So in the end, they wanna, uh, and, and you wanna tackle like, much more comp complex tasks with them. So you, you want to somehow, you, want, you, you don't want to uh, necessarily restrict yourself to a single uh, node or single GPU, what have you. You wanna basically think about like splitting these models up in the future. And this is a plot by uh, OpenAI. Uh, like, this is a, a study like how many petaflops uh, per day, how many, sorry, petaflops per second days you need to invest to train a model. So, and when you look, for example, at the DeepMind ones, this reinforcement learning here, alpha go zero and alpha, alpha zero, they need a lot, a lot, a lot of flops, right? So you need to parallelize that. You cannot do that on a, on a workstation anymore. So, um, and, I think this trend will just go go up, right? So this is your Dota, uh, 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 Dota uh, which also like it's like ten petaflops per uh, uh, ten petaflops days, right? So this is kind of a it's like technically on Cori for like ten days you need to train the thing. <clears throat> okay, so as I say, I, I talk very briefly about matrix multiplications. Why it's important. Um, uh, and it's very easy. So when you look at all the deep learning primitives you have, it's basically exactly that. So um, for example, when you have a, a fully connected layer is the most obvious, right? So this is just like you, you, uh, uh, you basically connect all the input features with all the output features, right? So this is just the matrix modification, right? You know that when you code it up in TensorFlow, for example, it's exactly, you write down that, right? So, but also convolutions can be casted into uh, matrix modifications. You might not know that because it's not that obvious. If you do not work with the, the underlying kernels, uh, really, then you, uh, you might not have seen it or might, uh, um, might not be aware of it. So what you could do, this is one method, I don't say it's the most efficient one. This is called uh, convolution lowering or image to column or triplets matrix approach. So when you want to have a, when you have a convolution, so you have like this, this uh, two by two stencil and you apply it to this like uh, uh, input uh, image, which is here like a four by four image. You basically can map this onto a matrix multiplication. So you can basically uh, unroll the image, uh, where you basically take all the, the var variables in the stencil and put them into like the columns of the image for each filter, right? Um, oh, sorry, for each channel. And then do the same with the stencil, which is then technically just a vector. And then you can multiply these together and uh, unpack it again into an image form and then you have the convolution output. So also that is a matrix multiplication. There are other algorithms which, uh, which are not like this here. So this was for a long time the, the, the most common one. There are now more modern algorithms, but even they basically rely under the hood on matrix multiplications, even if they are like smaller size than these big ones here. So this is not very memory efficient. And then late, lastly, when you look at LSTMs, it's the same thing. So when you, uh, <coughs> when you basically look, we have an input sequence X at the time T, you want to produce an output sequence H of T, and uh, you have all these gates here, right? So these are like activation functions. These are uh, element-wise multiplications. But what you essentially have is you have all these weight multiplications with the input vector, right? So this X is a feature vector, and you uh, basically act with some weights on it and, and compute outputs. And you do this uh, uh, like a couple of times for like a, a typical LSTM layer. So that means like it's all about matrix multiplications and uh, so in, in, in the end, you want to make those fast in a distributed setting. So one, one, uh, that said though, usually the, the, the feature vectors here are very small. So you, it, it might not make sense to distribute that. So just this, this is, uh, so it, all, uh, it's, it depends on the size. Um, so the, the way you distribute the training depends on the size of the, of, the, of the objects you're dealing with. And I will come to that next. But first, uh, let's talk about the collective communication. So 
Why are communications, um, collect communication primitives important? Because uh, as you will see for like distributed training, you need to communicate data between nodes, right? And uh, you can do this in a clever way and you can do this in a, in a, in a trivial way. And mostly, fortunately, most of the frameworks already do it in a very efficient way for you. You don't have to care about this yourself. But it's nevertheless good to know um, if you might be at some point more interested in looking at the layers uh, underneath what actually is, is going on on the system. So this is a very HPC part of the talk now. And uh, uh, if you're not really interested in doing some, in looking in, uh, like in analyzing the communication behavior of the application, uh, you might not uh, need to pay attention that much, but it's kind of interesting to know um, about like certain things. Okay, communication complexity. So let's talk about this briefly. So uh, usually when you, have, uh, when you have a training setting, you have a number of, of workers or ranks or processes we call P and they need to communicate data, right? Uh, and co uh, communicating data costs you like bandwidth, right? For every package you send, you basically uh, take a, a, big, uh, a, a small chunk of the uh, bandwidth of the network, right? So uh, you have a latency, right? The, the message needs some time to arrive uh, to its destination and you have some overhead. So for example, when you, when you wanna communicate something, you might need to, from, from the GPU, for example, you might to download the data uh, uh, then uh, and send it off to the interconnect or the, the, uh, the interconnect can grab it directly from the GPU but nevertheless you have some overhead to basically pack it to the to the interconnect and then shift it off from there and um, and you have a message size s right <clears throat> so uh, and you can care about three different things you can care about runtime I think this is what most people here might care about because uh, in, in a practitioner setting uh, runtime is everything you just want to want to get make your communication go fast you can also think about memory, right? So some of these communication primitives uh, uh, need a lot of like additional memory to what you anyhow have. This is usually not a big deal for deep learning. For example, what you can do if you have GPUs, you can do the training on the GPUs and all the communication on the CPUs uh, concurrently. And the CPU has much more memory and usually the objects you want to communicate have um, uh, uh, are much smaller than the whole model plus weights, plus activations, all these things, right? So this is usually not an issue, but of course, if you are in a kind of setting um, where you are like, uh, where you do like a distributed edge computing or something, this might actually be an issue. And then the last is energy. So uh, how much uh, energy does my algorithm consume? So th there's a difference between static and dynamic. Static is basically like the baseline of this algorithm, but you have some algorithms which do some, have some communication epochs which are more intense than others. That means you have like spikes in your energy consumption. And that can be uh, important when you, join a company like, I don't know, Facebook, and you want to have operate a data center under a power, under a power envelope, you might want to look at that stuff. Okay, so uh, just to explain how that works, you have like, you have, a, a, you have a, a process P0 who wants to send a message to process P2. It packs up the message, this is this overhead O, and then it sh uh, shoots off like one package, another package, another package, right? So assume we, we do like multi-threaded communication, we can split this message up, and basically the whole thing is S times G. So every, every small like fraction is basically a unit of bandwidth G. And the latency is now the time, for example, when my uh, last message left the interconnect to the, uh, when it arrives. So like once the message leaves the interconnect to when it arrives at the destination, in the NIC at the destination, and then you need some, uh, invest some overhead to basically take the message, unpack it, and uh, use it. So uh, this means that the communication uh, complexity, so like the, the time it takes to send a single message is like the latency, plus two times the overhead because you need to pack and unpack it plus uh, the size times the bandwidth, okay? So that's like the, the communication model. This is for sending a single message to a single, single worker. So, and then you can, you can think about, so what, what kind of like communication primitives do you need? And there are rooted ones and rootless ones. So what's the difference? Rooted ones is uh, something like uh, broadcast or gather where one process sends stuff to every other process or one process gathers data from all the other processes. That's rooted because you have one node which, or one worker which sticks out. So that is, for example, done when you do a, a parameter server in deep learning, right? Then you have these kind of communication behaviors. So it's a, it's a rooted communication. So, and there's like things you can do. So there's the, the very, very simple one. I think this is what most uh, deep learning frameworks implement in the beginning. It's like a, it's like a flat tree. <laughs> it's very simple. You basically send like messages or receive messages from every worker individually. Uh, and you can think about how that scales, it's basically scales with the number of workers, right? So that is like the, the most uh, simple one you can do, but it's still important uh, because this, this thing is like part uh, of a of lot of other communication algorithms. Uh, 
Then you can also do trees, right? So like uh, the next better thing to do is a tree um, where like you have one root node and then you can, um, you can think about, uh, if you wanna, for example, assume you send messages to the left branch first, you can just compute the whole communication complexity by just looking at how long does it take till node number six in this case uh, uh, receives the message, right? So basically, uh, and, and, and you do not need to wait for this thing to, to finish, right? Because once, you once node zero shoot off this message and no your node two receives this message, it can basically directly uh, send a message to node six, okay? And what you see here is that if you have very high latency, it scales with the depth of the tree, which is eh, uh, very bad, but still, the, uh, in terms of message size, it just scales with the depth of the tree and not with the number of workers. So it's definitely better when you have bigger messages, yes. Assume that, yeah, that this is basically, basically what you, the idea here is you shoot the first message to, so you shoot a message to one, to two, to three, to four, to five, to six. So basically you have to wait, you have to wait till, till node zero, sends like the message to node one, to two, to three. It, you don't need to wait to receive it, right? So this is the overhead of packing up like uh, P minus one messages, plus like uh, the, the, the bandwidth, like the, the, the size of each message, right? Uh, and this is the overhead of impacting it on your side, less S node six. Of course, when you have congestion or some of these paths can be longer than others in the net, in a real setting. So you basically take the longest, the longest, so like the maximum latency. So for example, when you go to supercomputing system like Cori, it has a, um, it has a uh, Aries interconnect, which is like a dragonfly topology, which is diameter five. This means that you can send a message from one node to any other node in five hops max. But there are like connections where you only can have one hop. If it's in the same chassis, you might have one hop or two hops. So which means that of course, when you have a tree spanning the whole machine, uh, the, the latency will basically be um, like the, the, um, the relevant latency is the latency to take uh, it uh, between like this five hop connection. It's technically, the latency, no, this is technically to, uh, the thing is that you send a message down this tree, okay? Um, this means that you don't, this tree doesn't need to wait for that tree to finish. Like what, when this message is sent and, you, and your, your, root, your root node receives its message, you can start broadcasting. So this tree, this branch goes in parallel to that branch and at every, Every sub every subtree can go parallel to next to any other subtree. So this is a binary tree, but you can do it with k nodes. So k array tree. Um, and one thing, this is non-personal, which means that um, basically it's like a reduction. So f, f, or like a like a broadcast. So every node uh, gets the same message, right? You can also think about a personal one where every node gets a, gets a personal message. And that's, in that case, you basically need to send more packages in the, on the first branch because ev for every node, you need to have a different, different message, okay? So that, then the com uh, com uh, communication complexity is a bit bigger, but uh, it's still better than the, the direct send possibly, okay? This, this assumes that you do a collective communication. All the nodes communicate collectively. They don't run different stuff. They run, they run this assumes that you need, to, you need to send the same data, so to the same data to all the nodes. For example, when you do model broadcast, at the beginning of your training, you do model broadcast, you need to copy the weights to all the nodes. So when you do that, then actually you would use something like that. So you basically send your model along this tree so that every node gets the same model. And you need to wait for this thing like until uh, all the nodes are done. And that is usually when you, when you assume that you send through the left branches first or the right doesn't matter. So like assume you send through the left branches first, this is the time it takes uh, for the data to arrive at, arrive at node six, assuming that all these communication uh, lags are equally fast. So this is just, this is just technically an upper bound. And then on, in a real setting, you need to run simulations to get like this, this thing, right? But this is just like to see what kind of algorithms are better when you uh, run it for, in different settings, right? The good thing here is you don't need like, uh, you don't have this many to one. But the thing is here, if, this, if you have a lot of, lot, of, lot of nodes doing that, you basically fresh the buffers of the interconnect. So what will happen is that uh, you, have, you get network congestion with, with this, right? Because every, every node is sending to one node, like all the links of this node will be totally saturated with data. And uh, the message queues in the interconnect, which receive the messages and put them in a queue, uh, if, the, if the queues run full, it will not receive further messages and, and tell the communication like on the other side to wait to send more. And then you will get basically like back pressure on the, on the network. So if you have a lot of, lot of nodes, this thing will actually break down. So this is why these trees are better, but I will come to that. So this is the personal one. So just personal ones that every node gets a different message, right? So this is why you need to send three here. One is consumed by this root node and then it sends one down the tree. 
So there's also one thing is the, the <clears throat> which is a rooted one is a pipeline. Uh, that is actually important uh, because I will, I will sign in, uh, show on the next slide why. Because there was, uh, like recently I would say, like two years ago, there was some breakthrough in distributed deep learning where they implemented an algorithm for distributed training, which is actually based on a pipeline. But in the HPC world, this is quite old stuff, right? So here the idea is you basically, uh, uh, non-personal or personal, doesn't matter. You broadcast, you want to broadcast these messages to all the nodes. And assume you want every node should get like, uh, should get like the same thing. What you do is you inject a message to node one and this node passes it on down the tree, right? For the, for the um, personal case, you basically uh, send the message, which is uh, uh, destined for the last node first. And then the next step, you, you send it for the second to last and so on. And then the, the nodes just pass it down the pipeline. And in the end, you can compute that this is basically just two times the length of the pipeline. And when you close it, so basically seven feeds back to zero, you have a ring. And that is actually, there was this uh, paper by uh, Baidu, I think, where they implemented the ring reduction algorithm, uh, which was like, uh, in the deep learning community, was like, oh, wow, that's awesome. But actually, that's a pretty, pretty old concept, and it's not mo uh, very efficient, because it scales with the number of the, of the nodes you have in the pipe, um, with twice the number. So, but still, if you have a few nodes, you can actually nicely hide uh, like a lot of the communication. So in general, this is not a bad algorithm but you should not use it at large scale. So this is something, for example, assume you have a, uh, have a system where, uh, where your GPUs are connected in a linear fashion or like in, in a ring, you can, you can easily use that, for example, to do a reduction within the, in the box. But then once you go out to like, like multiple boxes, this might be inefficient, right? So as I said, so this is not, um, it's not a bad algorithm, but like for, for like scale, it's, it's not very good. So, there is also the root, uh, so this is a rootless example. So everybody gets everything now. So uh, sorry, this, this was the same. So like when you have this ring, technically everybody gets every message if you do it right. And uh, this is the direct send. So assume you have like an all to all connection. For example, you have a, you have a DGX box, um, which is basically a box with two CPUs and uh, eight NVIDIA GPUs, or in the more modern version of DGX2, you have basically 16 GPUs in a box uh, connected in all to all fashion. You can basically do that because you have a certain amount of bandwidth between all the all the GPUs, like bidirectional, like 25 gigabytes per second or something like that. So you can basically shoot off messages to everybody at the same time. So like everybody sends to everybody and everybody receives from everybody. So that is, uh, if if you have enough bandwidth, that is awesome, right? And it just scales with the number of processes. So for for a box, that's totally fine. A more clever algorithm is butterfly. So this is actually implemented for a lot of all-to-all -all communications if you have a power of two in the nodes. If not, then, then it very, becomes very complicated and I don't want to talk about this. But the idea here is you start at the beginning and you just send basically to your, to your uh, so like node zero sends to one, node one to zero, and you have basically this cross communication. And then this is the first epoch and the next epoch Node zero sends to like node two. So basically you send out to the two nearest, uh, nearest neighbors. And then in that case to the, like the, the next group. The cool thing about this is that uh, it scales with the, the, the binary lock in P. And you can basically like, just like uh, do an all to all communication or like in this case, it's more like, um, this is a non-personal. So this is like, everybody gets the same, uh, same message. So this point again, all reduce in, uh, in like lock two P time. So this is quite efficient. But of course, as you see, you need a lot of like interconnectivity here. Otherwise you, 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 uh, you will basically like run congested network. So this is very important uh, algorithm to think about. And I think most Fourier transforms or like, like, big, like uh, big all reduces and stuff like that are implemented with this. So there's also a personal version of that where your basic message size grows when you go along the, the tree. Okay. So one thing to remember, the optimal collective Communication depends on the use case. So if you are, uh, uh, for example, aiming at best runtime, you should really look at the runtime complexity. There all these algorithms have memory efficiencies. So like uh, uh, memory complexities. So um, this is basically, uh, you, you need to take, uh, take this into account when you are like in a, in a, in a uh, so I have uh, sorry. So they have a memory complexity and an energy complexity. And I haven't like put them on the slide because I don't care that much about it, but you should really think about these things when you like uh, design a cluster which should operate under power constraints or memory constraints. So, and the most important thing is 
look in the HPC literature because uh, a lot of stuff is getting reinvented in the deep learning world. And actually it's, it's well-known stuff in HPC for decades now. So uh, there's a lot of like, like fancy algorithms, even like more fancy versions than the one I presented, uh, <clears throat> where you combine trees with pipelines or like butterfly with pipelines, things like that. You can, you can do a lot of like crazy things. And there's like, if you have a certain communication pattern, for example, if you implement a library or something and you, you, you got stuck with something, you just should look in the HPC literature. There's a lot of stuff. I, in, in the end of, the, of this talk, I will give a list for like a suggested reading about these kind of things. And um, so as I said, the air literature sometimes try to try to reinvent the wheel. Uh, yeah, don't, uh, don't, don't just fall uh, into this trap. Just, just most of the stuff is old news. And uh, one thing I want to say, uh, it sounds a bit dated, but like MPI is actually very optimized. So when, when your library makes use of MPI, for example, uh, you're, you can be sure that it basically implements the most efficient algorithms you, you have. Because uh, normally if you have a cluster and the MPI which ships with that cluster, um, is uh, usually uh, it, it makes already the right choices for you. For example, on an, on, an, on an HPC system where you have a tweaked MPI, it makes use of like a lot of like features, like hardware features, like maybe, uh, uh, for example, uh, hardware atomics, where you can accumulations for sort of small messages very efficiently in the network hardware, or like it re uh, respects topology, so can, it can switch between like a butterfly combined with a tree algorithm when you, when you cross different like uh, long distance links in the, in the network topology, so like with lower connectivity uh, and things like that. So, uh, so the, these, these libraries are usually very, very optimized for number of processes, uh, the message size as a topology. So it makes the right choices for you. Uh, and I recommend using libraries like that. Not necessarily saying that MPI itself is the best, but there's a lot of things like NVIDIA Nickel, for example, when you use GPUs, just use that and make sure that the NVIDIA guys do a good job or like MPI for Intel or what, like for like um, any like commodity cluster. Okay. So now more specific to deep learning. So we have like a certain parallelization strategies. Uh, there is like data parallelism where basically every, every process is running its own model, uh, running, sorry, running the same model, and then you reduce the gradients. I will talk about that later. There's model parallelism where you have a single model which is split across the ranks. And then there is layer pipelining where you partition by layer. So for example, process one does a chunk of the model, process two does a chunk of the model uh, in a pipeline fashion. So, and I will go from, from behind because it's easier to explain. So layer pipelining. So how does this look like? So the layers are distributed across the ranks uh, or the worker. And that is basically what was implemented um, in Google TensorFlow by default. If you, if you use like uh, the WIF device, uh, so with, for example, um, uh, the, the WIF device scope, um, and then you put it on different GPUs, different parts of the model, it will essentially use, use this kind of parallelism. Um, so the idea, so this is the extreme version of it. Uh, you basically have, let's say, a, a weight and an input vector. You put it on, no, uh, on rank zero. Then you, you compute this thing, compute the output, uh, pass it on to node, node two, uh, sorry, node one, where you multiply it with another weight and pass it on to node, uh, node two. So the thing is that um, this is the most extreme version. Of course, you won't do that. You basically have a, a couple of layers on, node, on rank zero, a couple of layers on rank two, but this is like the, uh, uh, just for illustration. And the good thing about it, you only need to uh, have nearest neighbor communication, right? Because you only send it to the next guy in the pipeline. So no collectives, which is great. Uh, on the other hand, um, it, it comes to certain drawbacks. And we'll talk about this like uh, in the next slide, we'll see that. So for the backward pass, um, you need to compute the, the gradient with respect to the activation functions, uh, because you want to have the gradient with respect to the, to the uh, output basically, and the gradient with respect to the weights, right? And the thing here is that uh, this you need to update the weights and this you need for your back propagation, okay? So when you go back, you have basically from, your, uh, from the previous node, from node one, uh, sorry, from node two, you get this, this activation gradient and then you uh, multiply it with the transposed weight and that you send back to, the, to node zero where it's like dotted with the, with the transposed weight of that node, okay? So basically you just do the whole pipeline backwards. That's all what you do. So that is for uh, computing the, the, uh, the, the gradients of the activations. Uh, for the uh, gradients of the weights, in order to update the weights, 
you basically just uh, do the same. You just take this vector, but this time you don't multiply it with the weights, but instead with the other activation, which is not local. So it's the same communication pattern. You just multiply it with a different, uh, different vector. That's it. And then you get the gradient of the weight. You can incorporate it. So there's still no, com uh, no collective communication necessary. Everything here, uh, you just need to pass this, these, these gradients of activations around uh, along the pipeline. So that's it. There's one thing though. Um, so first, there's a very simple implementation, right? You can just, just, just do it. On the other hand, while you pass a batch down this pipeline, you do not want to wait for it to come all the way back uh, and, uh, for the backdrop and then integrate the gradient. So this would be like fully synchronous training. No, no, you want to really like have a pipeline where you, for example, you feed batch zero here, pass on the results to the other node. And while you do this, you feed in batch one. And then you pass it to the other node. And so this has batch zero now, this is batch one, and then you feed batch two here. And when you look at it and you go basically all the way down and go all the way back, you have the gradient of batch zero, but you already fed batch five to the system. Which means that once you incorporate that guy, into, into this model, all these gradients here in the pipeline will be outdated already, right? Uh, so that means you have some kind of like asynchronous training. And the, the, uh, the, um, the deeper your pipeline is, the more problematic it becomes because these things become more and more outdated the deeper you make it. Yes. Uh, this is an issue if, it's, if, if you do go to the extreme, right? I mean, if you have like a, a pipeline of one or two, it's usually fine. But uh, if you make this like a thousand nodes long, it will not learn anything. Because then you have like a thousand step outdated gradient to incorporate, it just doesn't make any sense. Okay, and it's also the issue is here that the load balancing is very tricky, right? Because um, here it looked very even when I draw it. But the thing is that usually most models basically pull down data. And even if you have, for example, an autoencoder, you pull down the data and then you pull it up again. Or you project it down to a smaller, smaller size and then project it up again. And you want that in order to, to basically, ha that you do not want the nodes to run idle. So the computation time, the processing time per node should be constant. That means you need to chunk up your model in a way, the layers in a way that the computation time is almost constant between them. Uh, and that is quite tricky. So this is the load balancing here is very hard. Um, so this is why I do not recommend that. If you have like two GPUs, fine, uh, or free, but if you have like, uh, if you go like to the extreme, it won't work. Model parallelism is a bit more balanced because what you do there is like all the layers basically are on the, like parts of all layers on all nodes. So that makes the load balancing easier. You just split up the layers. Okay, so uh, you can, for example, uh, split in the feature dimension uh, for like a fully connected layer. And how does this look like? So you have this matrix W and then process zero earns the upper half, process one the lower half, and uh, the feature vector is earned by everybody. Right, the input vector x. So this is basically the number of features. This is the batch size. And you dot it in, and then you get an intermediate, uh, intermediate result. And then in order to produce a feature vector, which is shared across all the nodes, you need to like uh, gather it, right? Because node zero needs the uh, results of node one, and node one needs results of node zero. And if you have like a bigger vector, you basically need to gather the results from all the nodes, okay? In that speech of before, this is basically a, um, a rootless uh, personal communication. Okay, <clears throat> so this means this all gather is necessary for the forward pass. So the forward pass is not local. So for every step in the forward pass, you need communication, okay? Which is bad because technically you need to wait till all the nodes are done with this to, to cast the all gather to basically grab the results. Backward pass is similar. So, <clears throat> For computing the gradients of the weights, that can be done totally locally. Uh, so you just have to, you have this, uh, the transposed inputs, you have the output, right? Because you gathered it. And then you just do local metmol and get the gradient of the weights and you just take your chunk, the, the chunk you need. Fine, you're done. So that's totally local. But the gradient for the activations, uh, that is, or for the, for the input, that's actually more tricky. Because here, when you transpose the weights and multiply it with the input vector, you see that you get an intermediate state where you have just a very low rank, right? When you do matrix multiplication, a, a very small fraction of the data. And you need to all reduce that on, on a big group. So that means in order to uh, do the backprop, because this guy is needed for the, for the previous layer to do the backpropagation. So that means while you backprop through your network, you basically need to communicate. 
So in the forward pass, you need, you need an all gather. In the backward pass, you need an all reduce. Only the gradient updates can be done locally. So you cannot overlap really nicely these things, OK? So that is quite, quite bad. The good thing is, if you have a very large model, you can split it up, right? You don't want to split, up, split it up too crazy, because the issue is if you have like, a, if, you, if you run out of parallelism on the node, right? So if you have like a matrix which is 1024 by 1024, say, and then you, uh, you, you distribute it, uh, you chunk up this, this, this dimension 1024 by, say, uh, 128. That means that you don't have a lot of parallelism on the node. So you cannot make use of your multi-core CPU or your GPU very efficiently because the matrix multiplications are small and you get a lot of overhead. So you cannot do this uh, uh, crazily. Like you're limited by model size how you can scale it out. The good thing is you don't have this like grow of batch size because the batch size is still the local batch size, right? Uh, so you don't need to tweak your uh, hyperparameters. There, if, if it works on a single node and you distribute the model across this, uh, uh, like this, you can still just use the same parameters and it will just work. Um, forward and backward pass require expensive auto, uh, like, um, what's say like uh, rootless uh, uh, communication. So this is quite, quite bad, collective communication. And then also like, especially for the backprop, you cannot, uh, when you are backpropping at LK, layer K, you cannot go uh, to LK minus one without waiting for this collective to finish. So it's hard to overlap communication with computation in the setting. The thing is also that the batches, because you, you need the full feature vectors on all the nodes, which means that the batches, so the input, is also shared across the nodes. So like everybody gets the same input vector. Uh, and then you can do, you can everybody read the same data from the file system, which is kind of like bad for the file system or with just one node reads the data and distributes it, which again is another communication step you might want to avoid. Uh, yes, and you, you need to big models to do that actually. Um, you also need to store the full activations uh, per rank. This can be quite expensive uh, because the activations is usually much, for example, uh, uh, bigger than the size of the weight. So you save this, the number of weights you store per node, but you want to keep the activations around and these are much, much bigger usually. So, uh, because if you have a sparse network like convolutions, the weights are like kilobytes, and this can be easily a megabyte or something. So this is like, uh, from memory footprint-wise, this is not very good. And there's another way of uh, doing model parallelism. So I'm sorry for the formula. I don't have a nice picture here. You can draw nice pictures. Assume you have an image in a, um, uh, so as I said, com uh, you can map convolutions to matrix multiplication, but assume you don't want to do a direct convolution, but you basically have the stencil moving. Uh, so like the filter moving over the image and you compute the, the weighted sum. Um, assume uh, when you think it from an HPC perspective, or from, uh, uh, it, it's like a stencil operation, which is basically like a, uh, like a for example, a differential equation kernel operating on chunks of a, of a data set. So what you could do, you can have, if you have a big image, you can chunk up the image. And then, so basically this is the input image, you just chunk it up into domains and then compute the output per domain. The issue there is that, uh, so the good thing is you can save the, the whole input vector because you chunk it up, but, um, you do nearest neighbor communications because the issue is when you when you have a, uh, uh, usually the uh, when you when you see this here the the filter has an extent and when you hit the boundary right you you technically need uh, data points from your neighbor so that means you need to you need to do some nearest neighbor exchange this is quite common in HPC uh, where you basically have like partial differential equations you need basically uh, in order to compute the derivatives at the boundary you need your you need your halo from your from your neighbor so that's exactly the same thing. Uh, and you need to take care of that in forward and backward pass. So that's quite, that can be quite costly, but you can do this um, if you want. So I think this only makes sense if you have a huge input image, like a gigapixel panorama or something. So like, otherwise this, this won't help you a lot. Just to, uh, uh, just uh, as a note. And the other thing, you can just split up the, the filters. So the number of output filters, uh, sorry, the number of input filters, you can basically split up and also technically the number of output filters. Um, so that like, <clears throat> Uh, in general, this, this, this G, which is like the, 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 the kernel, so this is the, the output filter dimension, the input filter dimension, and the height and width of the kernel, you just split, split up this thing, and different nodes compute different, uh, different chunks of it. Uh, but also here, you need an all reduce in the end because every, uh, every node wants the whole output, right? And an all gather. So this is not, not very um, um, efficient either. Uh, and you don't save much memory because these guys cost nothing, okay? So just just in case this, uh, this comes up. It's, uh, some people thought about it, but I think it's not really uh, feasible. 
data parallelism. So this is the most important one because this is what basically all the frameworks do. Um, this model parallelism part is very hard to implement framework-wise, I would say. Um, so this is, this is the most, uh, 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 the, the way it's done today. And that also causes these issues with large batch training I will talk about uh, after that. So how does it look like? So assume <clears throat> what you do is you just distribute the batches among workers, right? So like when you have an input vector X, so this is the global input vector, like processor zero holds all the features, but only like a chunk of the whole batch, okay? And then you multiply it with W and what you see, it's a local matrix multiplication. So that means that you don't need any communication for the forward pass, none, which is quite nice. The thing is that all the weight matrices have to be replicated across the workers. Okay, that's fine. I mean, usually these are not very big. Uh, so there's no communication. For the backward pass, a bit more tricky, but it has nice features too. So first look at this. So when you do the backprop, in order to compute the gradient of the previous layer, you need to, uh, <coughs> so, uh, you need to basically do a, a local matrix multiplication, this time with the transposed weights, but since the weights are local, that's fine. Uh, but on, on, the, uh, on the derivative of the activation, which is still like a uh, process local here. So you can do a local matrix multiplication, which has the following uh, impact that when you backprop, when you compute the result, so like the, the when you wanna, for example, you, you backprop for your, for your network and you are layer K, you do not need to wait for any communication. You can just do a local backprop of this, this gradient here and then like go on to layer K, K minus one. Right? You do not need to communicate anything. While this is happening, you can compute the weights updates which require communication. So uh, as you see here, you have basically the, the gradient activation and the input features, and then you dot them together like that, and then you need an all reduce so that everybody has all the weights, like the whole, the whole weight. So that means that the only communication required here is for the weight update, which is basically the reduction of the gradients across all the nodes. That's actually what it is. So, this is a pretty nice scheme, actually. So the forward pass is completely local. The backward pass, you can proceed without, locally without doing any communication, except for when you want to update the weights, right? Only those guys need to be communicated. So you have a lot of possibilities to overlap communication and computation here. And the activations uh, are split across the ranks, so it can reduce the memory footprint as well, right? You don't need to store all the activations for all the batches because you split up your batch. Uh, the weights get duplicated, so you need a full model on every rank. Hmm, okay, it's, depending on the size of your model, it might be a bit bad, but it's not usually super bad. Um, the batch size grows, right? So uh, you can, of course, say, okay, you have like 256 batch, a batch of 256, and then you go to 256 with uh, nodes with a batch size of one. You can do that, but then you run out of parallelism on your node, and what you'll see is your communication overhead grows like dramatically, and your, your local parallelism is very low. So this means that um, this is not efficient. So what you usually do is you have a local batch size, a meaningful local batch size of eight, 16, whatever you, whatever's reasonable for like performance wise, when you scale it out. And then you have like as a global batch size, just the number of workers times the batch size. Um, yeah, so uh, that is actually a, a, a big problem. Okay. So you can also play tricks here, right? Um, I wanna talk about that. So like in the original idea, um, as I said, you need to reduce the gradients. So you can do this like in an all synchronous fashion, okay? So um, you basically, for every, so when you do the backprop, you can hide like the backprop of the model with the, with the, um, with the computation or reduction of the gradients, but you still have to wait for the last gradient to be reduced. And you can basically do this in, in the synchronous setup where you really wait till this, till this is done. Uh, so the scaling can be problematic. So if you have, for example, uh, one node, which is very slow, or you have like a congestion or network, you have to wait for the last guy, right? So uh, that can really like uh, impact performance negatively. And it's also, as I said, that the effective batch size grows with the number of nodes. You can do it completely asynchronously. Um, this is, was, I think this was done for a bit in the beginning. Uh, where you send your weights to a parameter server, the weights keep the uh, the parameter server keeps track of the model, so it has basically the, the latest weights. The workers send the gradients, it incorporates into the model and sends back the model. So nobody waits for nobody here. You just want, when you're ready, you shift ship it off, uh, and it's very resilient. So if you die, so if a node dies, it dies, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, no, nobody waits for for this guy. It's just it will just work. 
however, when you think about it, since, uh, since this is very asynchronous, so like uh, the gradients they receive uh, are from different versions of the model all the time, right? So assume like one worker is always faster than all the others, he will basically uh, contribute a lot of fresh gradients, but all the others might uh, contribute very old ones. So uh, that means like the more workers you have, the more old gradients you contribute of various ages, which basically uh, can really heavily impact the co uh, convergence of your model. And also, if you have a very bad network, the parameter server can be a bottleneck. You can mitigate that by spreading that out, like for every layer, have a different parameter server, but still it's a, it's a bottleneck. And you might waste like a uh, computation resource because you wanna, might wanna use this node for training and stuff. And then uh, more recently, there's the stale synchronous update also called pipelining and it works like that. So assume you have like, um, you have a, uh, like say two independent systems. For example, you have an accelerator and a host process. So you have a very powerful interconnect. You can do the following, or you have like a lot of like uh, uh, additional like free, free compute on your, on, your, uh, on your CPU. So if you have a multi-core CPU, you can basically only, uh, many core CPU, so you can do, I don't know, like on 64 threads, you can do the computation and you have four remaining threads uh, or cores, you can do other stuff with. So what you can do here is uh, this. And the idea is that while you, while the workers compute the fresh gradients for the model independently, right? You can do this locally and push them into a local queue. While you do that, you pop from the queue gradients from a previous step, reduce them and incorporate them back into the model, okay? The good thing is that you can basically overlap the forward with the backward pass that way. Uh, the downside is that since you all reduce gradients which are outdated, by a couple of steps, can be one step, can be whatever steps, can be also be made dynamic. Uh, you technically don't have like optimal, um, you don't have the optimal like uh, gradient, the freshest gradient, right? On the other hand, it's not as um, random as this asynchronous approach where, uh, where you contribute uh, gradients of different ages all the time. So these are outdated by one step, by two steps, by three steps, but always by, 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 a, by fixed amount, okay? So that is actually uh, uh, much better, but also it's not very resilient, right? If one node drops out here, at, at least this step will fail, right? So it will basically like uh, stall on that. So like resiliency wise, um, it, it doesn't help, but it can smoothen runtime variability, right? So when you have like very, a lot of fluctuations in your network, you can think about making this dynamics. So for example, okay, I cannot communicate right now. My network is like totally like jammed with like a communication. Let's store a couple of more gradients before we continue. No, I mean, I don't know. So, like every gradient, every gradient once it makes it through the queue gets gets incorporated, right? So if you have a yeah, yeah. no, no, they, 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 no, no, no. You just push them into the queue. Have say like a leg, leg, two, leg one, which you, basically you have just like two gradients, right? So you have like one old buffer. You you you, you use the grades from that, and then you have a, a new gradient buffer. And once the old ones are incorporated, you just copy them over to the new buffers. So you basically alternate buffers, or you can have a queue where you just line them up, and once they're once it's their turn, they get incorporated, no matter what. But it's not received in the sense that if one of your worker dies or very slow, you have to wait for that guy all the time. Right? I mean, that's, that's the problem. But as I said, so if you have an HPC system, you can, <clears throat> if it's a, let's say, a mature HPC system in the sense that uh, it was operated for a while, you understand it, and it's like, you can, you can count on that almost all the nodes are equally fast. You don't have these like big, big problems. Uh, on a commodity cluster, of course, the, the performance variation can be much bigger and that can be a problem there. Okay, large batch training. Thought about that. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, so uh, as I said, we, we, uh, I just consider the, 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 the synchronous or reduce, the easiest case. Uh, uh, the other cases are basically um, uh, like the pipeline one where you have these outdated, outdated gradients there. There's, they're similar from the idea, but I just want to discuss this one because it's more, uh, it's the, the one like most people will use. <clears throat> so you have a local batch size of B and the global batch size is just the number of workers times B. Okay. So when you think about stochastic gradient descent, I think you have heard about that uh, in the last weeks. So you have like the weight, you compute the derivative of the loss with respect to that weight, and then you, you uh, uh, average over the batch and incorporate it back, okay? Uh, and what it will do basically stochastically, so this is a thing for conjugate gradient here, which is like a bit more deterministic, but uh, you basically uh, go into the steepest descent direction, right? <clears throat> so the idea is now, uh, while you do this, because you have larger batch, you have a larger average, of, uh, basically you're, if you have 
more batches, you have a more precise gradient, right? So the idea is because this average on this slide here goes over like more samples, you can think about uh, as, okay, I know much better what my actual gradient is. So you can think of, instead of doing like, for example, three steps with like, uh, like step one, step two, step three, I might uh, think, okay, since I know my direction better, I might just do one big step with three times the size, right? So I, uh, I basically increase the learning rate linearly. So hopefully I will end up in a very similar position to where I would end up with like uh, this, the, the three smaller steps. And that works when you look at it. So if you do like uh, two consecutive steps of like batch size B, this, uh, you basically su summarize this of doing like a, a step of size like, like 2B at once. Uh, so if you rescale basically learning rate, you do an equivalent step. And that of course assumes that the, the gradient with respect, um, I think it has a, a nabla missing here, that the gradients are uh, basically similar, right? So that, that they're not like heavily varying with, with each like batch. Of course, if your batch size becomes like huge, um, this, this summation or this assumption breaks down, right? So that is, that is the problem. Uh, any questions here? Okay. So there's also another motivation, what you, what you can do is rescale the learning rate by square root of n. And here the idea uh, comes from the observation of the covariance of the weights, um, which scales with the, um, basically with one over the batch size. And since it's a covariance, it's technically, um, uh, which means that you wanna, wanna consider like the, the uh, basically, um, so that, uh, how, how do I put it? So, uh, you know, when, when, when something scales stochastically one over n, you wanna try like the square root of it, right? Because, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so that's, that's like, how do I put it? So yeah, the idea here is that, okay, so the covariance basically is with n squared over b, which means when you, when you scale the, uh, and the batch size scales with, uh, uh, with factor n, this tells you that if you try to scale your, your uh, learning rate with square root of n, you might get the same thing as before. So that's the other idea, right? When, it, when you think of, uh, not of the, the, the gradient itself, but of the noise or like the, uh, the covariance, the correlation between the, the gradients, the autocorrelation basically. Um, so you can try everything uh, and there are like different like, uh, I would say um, different approaches, uh, and it, it really depends on the model you're training. You will have to try that out. Um, and I think there's this, uh, this paper uh, from OpenAI, and they basically looked at, at the noise, and they tried to de uh, determine like an, um, an optimal learning rate uh, depending on the batch size. And here you see it scales very nicely and then flattens off. So that means that here you hit a point where like uh, the noise in your gradient is uh, is technically too low, right? For this batch size, you can you cannot help it. It's basically it won't it won't work well. But for like up to batch size here, I would say like a hundred, you can still get a, a good speed up by just like tweaking the learning rate accordingly. But technically, you have to re re reproduce this plot for every model you run, which is costly on the other hand, right? Because you don't want to do this, right? You don't want to make this plot because when you can make this plot, that means you already trained your model, right? So that's a kind of like hand and egg problem. Uh, but maybe there's a way of deriving more general rules uh, for that. So this is why I say try linear scaling, uh, uh, square root scaling as well. So <clears throat> there's also a thing that in the initial stages, the gradients are very random. So even if you average over a large batch, you might think of like, oh yeah, let's, uh, I know my gradient very well, but that's not true because since it's very random, if you average over some, like a lot of like very random quantities, it's not necessarily better. And um, the thing is there that you do want, don't want to take big steps, right? So what you then can think about is some kind of like learning rate warm up or something where you start with a small learning rate and then you gradually increase it uh, after a couple of epochs to the maximum value of n times the learning rate or like squared n times the learning rate and then train from there. And what you see is that with larger, with larger batches in general, when you just scale it out, you get this, this thing here called generalization gap, which the, the maximum accuracy you can get is lower than the one. Uh, you, uh, you can get with like a smaller batch, okay? So that, that, is, that is a common problem. And why is that? So it looks like that um, um, basically uh, the larger the batches, the more sharp your minima are. So that means, <clears throat> and there are like, uh, so that means that technically uh, when, you, when you have the, so the, the, the 
the black curve, for example, is the landscape of the loss fund, of the, of the training loss fund, okay? So the, 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 it, you see you have a minimum here and you have a very sharp minimum there, okay? So assume you train your model and you are in this flat minimum so that you have to train the small batches, your minima are, are a bit like uh, smoother, okay? And then you have the, the generalization loss, uh, so like the, say the loss on the, on the test set, which is the red curve. And it's a bit shifted, right? It's not exactly the same because a different set data, part of the data set. And then, for example, uh, the, the optimal minimum would be there, but you are there. So what you, you will end up being here, which is not that bad, right, when you test. When you, though, are in a sharp minimum, so uh, you trained your model at a large batch size, you are in this very, very, very sharp minimum here, and your actual minimum you want to be is like somewhere like shifted to there, and you evaluate it there, you will end up evaluating it here, and you have a very bad loss. So which means your generalization is totally screwed. So um, this is basically like, this is just the conceptual sketch, but this is actually what happens, yes. If, if, you, if you look at the, um, uh, I think that's, yeah, that's part of the reason. So when you look at the Hessian, at the second derivative, you will see that it's very flat when you have small batches and more batches, if you have average over more gradient, or like if you use bigger batches, so average over more gradients in each step, you'll see that's very, very uh, sharp around the minima. I think the intuition is right, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's, ref so it's, it's very complicated. It's technically, uh, of course, with respect to the whole data set, right? I mean, if your batch size is the whole data set, you do conjugate gradient, technically. You don't do any stochastic gradient descent anymore. Um, <clears throat> and then um, uh, it's also somehow like, um, the, the, also the size of the data set, which is actually useful to you, depends on the complexity of the underlying, what like features in the data you want to learn. So you can have a huge data set, but technically it's all, they, you, they don't add more information to what you want to learn. So then it doesn't help you either, but determining that is much more tricky because you don't know how, what the complexity of your data set is. Uh, and then it, uh, yeah, so that's like the, the trade-off. It's usually, yeah, Mustafa. I think the best is just to try. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like, this is really like, this is, this is the problem with that. So it would be nice to have a more like, uh, like a more guided, way of doing that, like start with this, then increase this and stuff like that. But there's like really not, no good intuition, like, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> but this is actually what happens and this is why your generalization can get screwed when you try that. Okay, so this is like, uh, this is I think from uh, Cypher 10, from Yao, uh, uh, Berkeley. He looked at the, the, the Hessians for uh, around like, so like the, the, the dominant eigenvalue, uh, eigen, um, eigenvectors of the Hessian, the, the two dominant ones, so then you can plot it. <laughs> And uh, for 64 up to like 2048, and here you see that the minima becomes like uh, sharper and sharper, okay? And then you can think about when you go to 30,000, this will be like very, very sharp. And uh, then you don't generalize that anymore because this one would generalize nicely, maybe even that one, but this might be too bad. And it also depends on what accuracy you're aiming for, right? If you want to beat ImageNet, like you have to ve very beat the accuracy of other folks. But if you do something, where there's, where, where you're like a scientific, uh, scientific application where you basically go and say, okay, um, we still beat by far the, the, the approach which is there, like maybe handcrafted decision tree or whatever, and you, you're still much better than that, but you can train a model very, very quickly, then you might be happy with it, right? But of course, if you hunt precision, that's, that's like tricky. So if you are a company who want to make, makes money and makes money from, for example, natural language processing, the recognition rate has to be extremely high because people get annoyed if you, have, you only have like 98% uh, accuracy. This is really bad, right? I mean, they want to have 99 point something, right? It sounds, it sounds like a, a small difference, but for them, it's, it's really, it makes a difference of like consumers are happy or not, right? So <clears throat> yeah, but it depends. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, these are like basically just the top 20 eigenvalues. And as you see, when you go to larger uh, batches, basically you, you converge you converge to much higher spectrum. So that's like the idea here. Uh, it's basically uh, illustrates the point I want to make before. So there are things you can try to do um, to, to fix this a bit. So at the beginning, I said do like a linear warm up, for example, onto the, the target learning rate and then decay the learning rate, right? So uh, <clears throat> there's this Facebook paper like training ImageNet in an hour. So like, uh, what, is, what is the current record? 77 seconds or something, Mustafa? Uh, ImageNet training, 77 seconds? Uh, yeah, something like that. But okay, so this was, hmm? 
So this was like in the past. <coughs> so, but they, they, they show it very nicely that when you, for example, do a warm up and then you do a learning rate decay schedule, uh, you can get basically very nice accuracy here. So that's like uh, something, something uh, which works. But they also showed that uh, this is the validation error top one. It will increase rapidly with when you go really beyond 8K in this case. So you, you don't want to do that. So there's another idea of like, instead of decaying the learning rate, just increase the batch size, right? So, um, <clears throat> so they start at like batch size uh, 8,000, for example, and then while they train, instead of decaying the learning rate, since they have like a, a reciprocal like uh, relationship, you can basically say, okay, I just increased my batch size. Uh, so the, the, the idea is if I'm closer to the right minima, I might be, uh, by increasing the batch size, I make it sharper to have a faster conversion. So that's the idea behind it, right? Because if I already know where I am, then I can just like drop into it, into, into the minima. And then if it's sharper, it's easier for me. Uh, and that's basically what, what they do here. So like over the, over the time of the training, they increase the batch size. The thing is with this, it's very hard to implement in the sense that most, most frameworks don't support that very well, especially in a distributed setting. When you, when you, um, when you wanna change the batch size, you might need to dump your model and reload it from a checkpoint mostly, um, which is, uh, but this is a shortcoming of, of the frameworks. This is not like a principal issue. And there's also this adaptive batch size scaling developed uh, at Berkeley, which does this more like, um, more like uh, dynamically. So the idea is if you are currently, um, so it uses second order information for, from, the, from the, so like basically the curvature of the loss, uh, of the loss surface at the point where you are uh, in order to increase or decrease the batch size, okay? So uh, I don't wanna talk about this very much, but they showed that actually when you do this adaptive batch size uh, with, uh, so this is like, I think they do some, um, it protects them also from some adversarial examples. It will basically like converge to the right thing with the smaller batch size. So in, in, uh, in the same number of epochs, but since you have bigger batches, you get to that uh, number of epochs quicker, right? So like in, if you plot it versus time, it's faster. Uh, so this is up to 16K batch size. And the same was used for this uh, Sony paper uh, where they trained the ImageNet in 224 seconds, actually. So like, as I said, this is already outdated, right? This is from last year, I think. Uh, so now it's like 77 seconds in the record. So like, they, they try to like beat each other on the, on the uh, like uh, training time, time uh, side and the, and the accuracy side. So like maintaining the accuracy, but then uh, uh, cranking down the, uh, the tra uh, training time by a lot. So that's like, uh, just what they see, they see is that they use like, um, uh, batch, batch size control. So this seems to be successful for these kind of tasks. Okay. Um, so this is a paper by uh, OpenAI, I think, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, they show what, what Mustafa said, a relationship between the gradient noise and the critical batch size. And uh, it shows, it tells you basically uh, what, the, what the critical batch, how it's correlated to the gradient noise scale. And it looks like it's pretty linear along that line. Right? And is, you see that, for example, the, the reinforcement learning ones like the CS Space Invaders or Dota, they are pretty far up here. So you can use huge batches for, these, for training these. But when you try to use outer encoders or like, for example, Elmis, uh, you, you, you cannot do that. Right? You just like, um, you probably are stuck with like, I don't know, a uh, batch size of like a hundred or something. Okay? Uh, if you want to recover the same accuracy. Um, so of course, more complex data sets and tasks have, have a higher noise and you can basically use larger batches. So you can, for example, for these like reinforcement learning things, you can play like, I don't know, thousands of games in parallel kind of, right? So that's the idea. <clears throat> so which is nice for, uh, 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 which might be a nice application for HPC systems in that sense. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm almost like uh, through my time here because um, I want to have this other talk as well. So. This is um, the training time in hours versus the compute cost. So you, if you wanna cut down on that, you, you have to invest more compute. And this is technically the, the front where you, where you maintain your um, accuracy. And what you see here, for example, uh, when you compare that for, like, uh, for, like, uh, uh, for one of these reinforcement learnings, you have like 16 parallel players, when, when you have, then you need to train for like, uh, like 100 hours. And then when you like increase the number of players, you have to invest more compute but also you have to train much longer sometimes. And then you have like, this is 4,096 players that might already be too bad because your compute grows. Uh, so like here you gain a lot, right? By just cranking up the, the like you, you have to pay a little bit of more of compute, but you get a, a huge reduction in training time by an order of magnitude. But once you hit this point, you basically uh, 
So here, this is a point of diminishing returns, right? You have to increase your compute budget by a lot just to get like a small reduction in training time. So that's like, um, uh, you have to look at these like curves to, uh, but first you have to map out these curves, right? But maybe you have a model which is similar to a model where these curves already exist and you can maybe think about like what you can do, uh, what kind of like uh, parallelization, parallelization, parallelism is uh, reasonable. Okay. So there are like uh, other things I wanted to talk about briefly. It's like batch normalization, as you know. Uh, this is, you, you take basic an input batch, subtract mean and divide out the variance. Um, and scale it, uh, so basically do an affine transformation on it. And it has been shown for whatever reason, uh, so uh, previous, uh, I think the initial one said that it, it reduces the internal covariance shift, whatever that is. Uh, it's technically, uh, not, uh, so another paper has seen, shown that this is actually not the case. It ba basically improves some kind of like mathematical condition on the, on the, on the network, uh, on the loss function, which makes it much easier to train, much smoother. So the thing is still batch, batch normalization decreases the training time um, and improves robustness. For example, you can initialize your model with different initialization schemes and you still get a good accuracy at the end and also improves in generalization. I think this is undoubted. The issue is then when you do this distributed setting, you technically have to reduce all these tensors and you have to compute this, these quantities in theory on the whole global batch. And that is quite bad, right? You need a lot of overhead communication for that, especially the forward pass. So like these can be of size of X. So like this is like the, the can be of the size of the, the input, right? Or like of, of the output of a layer or something. So that's quite, quite big. Um, so one thing you can try is ghost batch. <clears throat> Assume you have a local batch size, which is big enough, like eight or 16. You can try to just update your, during training, you can just update your model using the local batch, uh, local batch mean and local batch sigma. And then when you go uh, for the training phase or for the inference phase, uh, sorry, for the inference phase for test validation, you can think about like taking, uh, basically computing these globally. Uh, when you look into that paper here, I referenced, they have like some weird update algorithm for like um, the, how to update these parameters on the fly, but I think it's not correct. And there are like some typos in the algorithm. So I would just take the global averages of these things and should be fine. <clears throat> so that, that is one thing you can try and it seems to work well if your local batch size is big enough. So like eight or 16 or something. Uh, so of course batch size one doesn't help. <clears throat> and uh, the other one is weight normalization. In that case, you just work on the weights directly in the sense that what you do here is you split I mean, it looks like a, like, a, like a weird trick, but it works. It will split the weights into a direction and the, and the scale, okay? So this is a multidimensional direction vector and a scale. So it's just the reparameterization. But then the trick is you update the gradients with respect to that, to that scale and the direction separately. So you compute these gradients. And the idea here is um, when, when you look at it um, in a different way, I don't want to do the math here, that actually the the weight direction updates are approximately orthogonal to the dominant eigenvectors of the gradient covariance matrix. So basically you, you don't f fall into the trap where you step along this vector, but you go perpendicular to that. So uh, you have a much more smoother, like, yeah, smoother um, convergence in that sense. So you can try that and that is totally a local operation, right? You use a little bit of math and do it locally. You just, all what you depend on are the, 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 the weight gradients, basically you already have computed. So, um, I gave an introduction of deep learning of the computation and uh, communication primitives. Uh, so a bit more like behind the uh, scenes, what's going on about like uh, talked about complexity uh, and how you can parallelize uh, networks like model parallelism, data parallelism, um, uh, layer pipelining, uh, what you can do when you are, um, uh, when you do not converge well on large batches, uh, uh, and you need to tune hyperparameters, unfortunately for that. <coughs> um, and how you can basically use batch norm or similar like uh, accuracy enhancement techniques uh, even at, at large scale without impacting your communication uh, a lot. So are there uh, any questions here? Then I will uh, do some suggested reading you can find on the slides. Thank you. So. Thank you.